Well, Jeremy, thanks for joining me. That's a pleasure. It's, it's nice to um, at least sort of talk about the outdoor world at a time like this. Um, we, I know yeah. it's been it's been a while since we were outdoors catching uh, monster roof, wasn't it? Exactly. Yes, that was <laughs> that was quite a special day. Yeah. Did you catch Did you catch a roof that day? Actually, I don't think I caught a roof. No, no I, I, I did. Um, I did pretty well on the species count. I was very pleased you to see the it. eels. I did well. I won apart from the 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 organising expert who who <laughs> actually caught everything. But uh, in terms of the guests, I, I was quite surprised that I did. I just seemed to have white one of a number of species. Um, I was very surprised and quite pleased to see the eels. That was um, you there don't see them very often, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So for the, so myself, Jeremy, Mark Everard, a few of us did a mini species match on the Kettenhaven Kennetonhaven Canal. Um, rough were the main target, but we we caught quite a few. So it was a good little uh, good little day. Like I think you, I think one of the quotes you said that I remember was you you don't have a rod under a a hundred pound line or something like that so you had to borrow some gear didn't you exactly that's that's why i don't do a lot of fishing in the uk i mean i've got quite a lot of stuff but most of it is is totally inappropriate yeah. <laughs> might be a bit overkill for a four ounce rough yes <laughs> uh, so what made you you know you, you're known for all this this work across the world what made you want to go around the world and, and chase all these monster fish oh I, that was a long time ago i mean i, I was uh, heavily into my UK fishing. I started off uh, river fishing in Suffolk, uh, all the sort of the normal stuff, your, your, your roach and chub and pike. And then I got into, um, I got heavily into carp fishing back at a time, you know, and this shows my my age, back when a double figure carp was a really big deal, you know, and, and, and <laughs> catching a carp of any description was, was quite a, uh, an achievement. I, I got heavily into carp. And then over the time that I was doing it, it became became more popular carp became more widespread and um and i think i sort of burnt out really i just um and, and for some reason you know having been a real sort of obsession it wasn't really doing it for me anymore i i oh i briefly fished for for wells catfish back then as well there were literally oh, okay. there were half a dozen waters in in in, in england that that held them and I, I i you know most people had never heard of them never seen them and that was i did that for a um, a summer um, and then I, I basically I gave up fishing um, and it was pure chance really I saw um, I saw a magazine article about Marcia in in India and, and that you know the way things work um, something just lodges in the back of your head and and almost you know while you're not aware of it that 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 forms an idea and and uh <laughs> and so basically yeah in, in 1982 i just found myself going to india um ridiculously low budget the cheapest flight i could find which was uh, ariana afghan airlines flying through kabul um i think 180 pounds worth of of, uh, of travelers checks uh, I had very little idea what I was doing, um, but managed to catch some Marcia and um, came back and actually had a couple of articles published about that. And I suppose that was where it started. I mean, it was, it's been a very long, very slow process, but that, you know, that was, yeah, that was me realizing that there, there are fish in other parts of the world. It is, it is possible to go and find them. Um, and also the idea that maybe, you know, this goal that a lot of us have is how, how do you combine your interest with possibly making some kind of a, of a living? I mean, it's very, it's very hard to do, um, but maybe there was a possibility for that. So that was, you know, like I say, a long time ago now. But um, So how did that yeah. transfer then from obviously you travelling around with... 10 quid in your pocket trying to catch a mars here in india or whatever how did that go from that to breaking into television because it's quite a leap really isn't it from you going off finding yes. YouTube and then having a film crew following you doing it yes a, a, a real leap um yes it, a, a lot a lot of time i mean from, from india i went to uh let me see i went to thailand i went to central africa congo um spent a lot of time in the amazon and at, at some point, I just had this this growing realization that the 
the, you know, the, the creatures that I was seeing, I've not seen them on TV. You know, you watch, you watch wildlife programs, you know, every single land animal, marine animal you can think of has, has been totally covered. Um, freshwater fish, no. I mean, you, you know, the, these incredible, I mean, uh, the appearance of them, the size of them, these are dramatic animals and nobody's, you haven't seen them on telly at all. And, but I had no idea how on earth, I didn't know anybody in TV, how do you, how do, you do this? How do you, um, uh, you know, how, how do you sort of make that, that leap? I, I did find myself being contacted by TV production companies, research, you know, I was writing the occasional article and, and people would contact me and they're gonna make a series in the Amazon or whatever, you know, do I have, uh, can I suggest people to talk to locations and stuff like that? And for a while I started, I, I would happily sort of give away information thinking this could lead to a job, this could lead to some payment or whatever. No, that never happened. So no, eventually, no, I thought, <laughs> so, so I thought, right, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. But it, that, but that made me realize how valuable some of the information that I had was, um, you know, I just amassed over 20 odd years so much information which um, I wanted to um, you know I wanted that somehow to benefit me if, if possible um, and the, you know the, fir the first thing was a real stroke of luck um, what happened I I I caught an arapaima in, uh, in in Brazil and I managed to get a decent photograph of it. Now this is back in the days of, of uh, film cameras and normally what you do, you're traveling alone, uh, maybe you catch a fish, you give the camera to somebody, they press the button and then several weeks later or months even, you know, you develop it back home and it's, it's out of focus, you know, it's, anyway. The dark ages, I, Jeremy. The dark, exactly. <laughs> uh, but what I did, I, you know, I, I actually, you know, I, I embraced a bit of new tech and I had a, I had a digital camera at this point with a, a, a video camera that took stills and it had a screen that flipped around. So I was able to get this thing over my shoulder and, you know, I, 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 um, I framed up the shot and then just got someone to take the picture. So I got a nice photograph, which ended up in one of the one of the dailies back here, one of the daily newspapers. Uh, it was seen by a producer at um, at, at ITV, um, who then spent nearly three years touting the idea around, and eventually got um, Discovery in the UK to 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 send me off to do what turned out to be Jungle Hooks. And uh, so that yeah, was that was the beginning. That. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. That was because I think that was on. Um, was it Discovery Home and? Oh, it might have been Home and Leisure then. It was Home and Leisure as yeah. it was then. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember that series. And then obviously that presumably led to the spiritual sequel of River Monsters. Well, it's eventually it did. I mean, uh, uh, what happened immediately after that was nothing. Here's me thinking, <laughs> uh, you know, this is great. I've got this this new this new career. And then it, it, it just went totally quiet for about three years. Uh, and then what happened was the, the director I worked with on Jungle Hooks, um, who, you know, who's a, a well-known director who, who does all sorts of stuff on the TV, but you know, he, he just um, phoned me up and just said, oh, I've, got, you know, I've just got to have a bit of a break. You know, why, do, why don't we go to India? You, know, you take a fishing rod, I'll take a camera. We'll just film some stuff and then we'll, we'll try and sell it when we, when we get back. And, um, and I said, well, what, you know, why don't we just phone our commission, you know, the commissioning editor from way back, you know, who, who did the, the Brazil thing and just see if they'd be interested in seeing what we shoot. Anyway, anyway, we ended up with a, with a commission to make a series in India as, as, as well. Um, so we, had to, yeah, we formed our own production company um, and we ended up, um, I mean that was it was a bit of a struggle, but we 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 ended up making this series in in India, which was called Jungle Hooks India, uh, three years after the original Jungle Hooks, and um, that was when we we got wind of this 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 crazy story of this man eating catfish in 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 a tributary of the Ganges, and because we were struggling with you know finding other material we just went and dug into that and it's this this fascinating story and it turns out that there you know there is this monstrous catfish that lives in those mountain rivers and this story could possibly make sense and i managed to catch one of these things not huge but a sort of a you know a respectable size i think it's 66 pounds or something and so we, anyway we made that 
uh, we made that series, but there was a bit of a feeling of um, of unfinished business. Uh, this that was it went out largely to an angling audience, and there was this thought that that possibly he, here is a way to to deliver freshwater creatures to a wider audience, sort of through the means of a, of a whodunit kind of thing. Uh, it has an actual story there. And um, well, I think that's one of the and, things that, um, well, certainly River Monsters as well did, is that you don't have to be an angler to to enjoy that. You know, so many people just watched mm. it for the, like you say, the whodunit aspect, the mystery yes. aspect of it, uh, and just seeing all these weird and wonderful fish that ordinarily you'd, you'd never get to see. That's right. I mean, that was uh, when, when, when we did, I mean, that, that very first program on, on the, on the Goonch Catfish, which was just going to be a one off. We had no idea it was going to lead on to anything else. But the idea was, um, we want this to appeal to, to everybody. And the problem with that is, though, I mean, it, it, it is, it is this real tightrope act, because if you, if you want to make it to appeal to both anglers and non anglers, uh, you, you run the risk of appealing to nobody. Uh, if you include too much sort of technical stuff about you know your technique, th then you know other people are going to get bored. Um, if you um, you know on the other hand you risk patronising the anglers, you know it's 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 quite a difficult course to to steer. But we 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 managed to pull it off and, and I think and got better at it as as time went on. I, um, I think that's one yeah. of the um, sorry sorry. I think that's one of the things with that's the problem with angling programs or with some angling programs is that they lean into fishermen too much and you know if someone's talking about oh i've got a waggler and a size 18 that's great if you're an angler you'll be eating that mm. up but if you're not an angler it's another language you're like what are they, what are they talking about so it is a, I, I completely agree it's a tightrope app isn't it you need to do enough that the anglers are going to enjoy it but enough that if you're not an angler you can still get a grasp of what's happening and, and going on Exactly. I mean, it, it, it is very hard to do. And I, and I think, yeah, most most angling programs don't really don't cross over. They've got to have something else. Um, and I suppose, you know, it, it very rarely have. I suppose a really good example is the, uh, you know, the Paul Whitehouse and Bob Mortimer, you know, that that is, you know, that 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 does it brilliantly. And, and again, it's by, you know, not overemphasizing the fishing. That is that is that is very much just a it's almost secondary on that program isn't it i mean like you yeah. know when i first watched it I was like, oh this will be great and you know the fishing's maybe like two minutes of the program and the rest is just them two pissing around but that's great you know that, you but know. it does but it does suffuse the whole thing which is great you know it really you know it, it it you get you get a sense that it is something that gives joy and and takes you out into the countryside i mean you know you don't have to labor that or preach about it it's just there and 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 um so you know that 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 is a and, and i think you know i think a lot of these things in, in, in yeah, a bit like river monsters in a way it's almost something you stumble on by accident once you once you've done it it just seems so obvious but actually uh that's that's being wise after the the event but you know in, in the beginning it's like oh you know i wonder if this will work is anybody gonna bother to watch this <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you you've i think you've kind of answered this but i'll, I'll ask what what was the emphasis on on big freshwater fish then as obviously there's so many big marine fish to choose from yeah, yeah. and arguably well, I, it would have been easier but why yeah why? well well i mean freshwater uh, in in this in the sea you know it's starting with jacques cousteau it's, it's all been done brilliantly i mean we did do one season actually in in in, in salt water which was which was interesting it was quite yeah, successful did, yeah. and, and um but no i think again this is something that i hadn't really thought about at the time but again looking back um the thing about rivers and lakes mostly is is that the you you have you have bad visibility as a, as you know as underwater camera and you, you know you know this I know, and, yeah. and, and, and so oh, I know. yeah so so you know to if you want to film stuff underwater um you've got a you know actually finding a place where you can do that is really difficult i mean a lot of places where a lot of fish are you're just you know you're not going to see in front of your your face so in other words so, so you know the only way you're going to see a lot of these fish is actually by bringing them out on a line now as soon as you do that that is potentially alienating a lot of people if you know again if the emphasis is on angling and you know a lot of these sort of yeehaw angling you know programs it's like you know a lot of people don't want to watch that but if you treat it is as 
you know, it, 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 it's a search that, you know, the fishing line is your sampling tool. You're almost doing it from that scientific perspective, you know, what is here? And again, the other thing that's really important is without preaching about it, it's, it, it's catch and release. You get the, you, you get the fish out, it, 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 it's out for, a, a, you know, just long enough to have a look at it. And then, you know what, this thing's going back, even if somebody says it bit their leg or whatever, actually, that wasn't the fish's fault. That was, the, you know, that was the swimmer's fault. They should have known it was there. So, so it's, you know, little, you know, things like, like that but yeah it, but it's yeah mostly it's the, it's it's the visibility thing and 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 that was great for us because the, you know there was um you know there's this gr amazing once we got started the, the, there's this amazing list of creatures that no, nobody's seen we just work our way through them and again as soon as you go anywhere and you start talking to people there there's there's stories as well and and so you, you know you just you just match the stories with the fish and 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 You've got all these. Um, you've got all this great material. So, is it because I was reading on uh, online a few articles one night, and it said one of the reasons that River Monster end ended was because you'd more or less caught all the fish, which I love. I love that idea. But is that is there some truth to that, or was it more just kind yeah. of a natural end? Or yes, the the uh, you know the material is finite. I mean the because the, again, if you think about river monsters, it's it, it's no, it was normally somebody uh, a story about you know somebody got bitten, pulled under the water. Um, what was responsible or it's uh, it's some kind of local myth you know a mermaid or something like that you know is there any any real animal that might be behind that and the thing is we yeah um there's a there's there is a limit to the, to those stories um you the trouble is when something is successful on on tv they just want you to do it forever <laughs> and and um the thing is, you know, you could maybe stretch a point. That, you know, the, and the thing is, there, there, there were definitely other fish out there which didn't fit that kind of, of story. And if you try and 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 you know, if you try and force it and make a story with these other fish, it's just not. It's just going to fall no. over. You're going to, you know, disgruntled gonna... goldfish or something. You're going to be yeah, ex exactly. You know, <laughs> ex exactly. So so uh, so yeah. So we ran out of those those programs, and and it's. Um, Whoa, what did we do? I did I did a series on different on rivers around the world, mighty rivers, and then we did something called uh, called dark waters, which 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 was sort of mopping up other um, some other stories. I mean, one one that I really enjoyed was about giant crayfish in Tasmania, and um, and and yeah, and that was you know all that was was I you know, I've heard I've heard that there's a crayfish in Tasmania. That grows to the size of a dog, and you, well, I, you know, I've just I've got to go and see that. I mean, that's all it was, but I mean, that's but that can be enough. Although getting that past a lot of TV people is like, oh no, there's not enough of a, it's not enough of a story or a mystery there. Um, and the thing is that you know that there, there absolutely still are stories out there, but it's you know what I'm doing at the moment is you know is trying to. You know, just you've got the you know the super tanker is you know you know how do we how do we how do we sort of how do we sort of alter course with 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 that but there's definitely yeah, there's other stuff to do for sure so i mean so was there any monsters that eluded you then i mean you say you more or less caught them all but was there any that you'd um that you'd heard of you thought, i'd love to see this really big fish but just it would prove too difficult to find or you're maybe you weren't even sure it existed uh there were there were a couple um i mean the um there, there, there was there was one episode where I where I failed to catch the fish. Um, I, I won't say what it is, but people, you know, people who people who've watched might get might have an inkling of it. And and, and actually, it, it just came down to it came down to bureaucracy. A lot a lot of it is is a lot of it is um, obviously if you're filming with a, with a crew in a in a foreign country, you don't just turn up. You've got to have permissions and all the rest of it. And um, we we needed um, we needed permission to to fish a particular place which I'd been told that we'd got and we get there and it turns out we haven't and, and so we've got to make some kind of program um yeah um but no on the on the whole I mean on the whole um I know anglers are supposed to, to hesitate to use the word luck but but I mean really really lucky uh, um sometimes yeah, sometimes right down to the wire last day something happens um that's the drama i guess especially with tv i mean they love that i guess don't abs they? absolutely you know uh, and and i think when when that really is the case and you you, you yeah you get that real 
sense of desperation uh <laughs> which which you which you can sense and because again i think the angling the angling that you know the traditional i say traditional but the sort of generic angling um, program i've got in mind is where someone tells you about a particular fish and then just goes oh yeah well this this corner of the river here looks like the perfect place to catch whatever it is lobs in a line pulls one out and goes there we go what did i tell you you know look at me i'm the expert it's like well you know even anglers get fed up with watching that because it's you know that's not the reality that most of us um most of us live in no well i say unfortunately, <laughs> if you caught everything you always wanted to catch it would you'd lose the magic a little bit wouldn't you absolutely yeah you would absolutely and apart from your uh, adventures targeting large roof when you're back in the uk uh, what what do you tend to fish for i mean you do do you, i presume you still fish in the uk every now and again very rarely actually i mean when i when i when i was off uh before i was working in tv when i when i was when i was off traveling um it was almost you know all all my energy all my you know all my my spare money went into trying to get away it did though so there was nothing left over to so i didn't i didn't fish in this country for for years um i've sort of briefly got back to it recently um the one thing that i've probably done more than than most is is um i i've, I've taken up um taken up fly fishing for for brown trout and when we you know when we're talking about brown trout you know we're talking we're talking tiny ones from a yeah. tiny little river but they're, but a lot of fun and and so you're you're on a on a sort of three weight or four weight uh rod you're you're under the trees um for, for me i'm at that stage where if i if i don't if I don't hook too many trees that's a good day for me um <laughs> and because in the course of river monsters I, I i i had the opportunity i never really fly fish when i was um you know i was i was very much a course angler uh didn't really do any fly fishing and through river monsters i i, I had the opportunity to do some some very exotic fly fishing so we're talking you know 12 weight gear 10 weight gear yeah tarpon arapaima D dorado in south america and i'd never really done the, the trout thing you know so uh, i you know I, I, i've sort of like come back to the other end of the uh the scale there and I, i'm 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 enjoying it it's, 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 it's you know talking earlier on about gear it's you know just using light gear it's it's a real sort of antidote to some of the more agricultural stuff that I uh, tend yeah. To well, do. the other thing that's become popular in the last uh, three or four years, I don't know if you've come across this, is the LRF. Have you heard that kind of the um, the light rod Ooh. fishing around the coastline, um, mm -hmm. and it's where people target mini species on little lures. So they'll go after gobies or blennies, which maybe 15, 20 years ago you'd have thought. That's bonkers. Why would anyone target that? And there's a, there's almost a, a a lovely community of these anglers, and it's nothing to do with size. It's just all the different species they can get, all these little mini species, um, particularly around the south. I've, I've yeah, I've, I've heard of that. I've heard of that in fresh water as well. Um, and of course, you've got tenkara, haven't you? Which is a similar yes. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, to me, they all they do seem a little bit sort of. I don't know, a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not really a, a, a sort of a gear person. I mean, what I, what, what I really like and what, you know, what I used to do when I was traveling on my own is just, just a, a really basic general purpose, you know, one light rod with maybe, I don't know, sort of eight pound line on, you know, maybe a couple of different spools and then, and then my heavy rod and, and that was it, you know, and just, and just some leads, some hooks literally the stuff that you can carry on your on your back and then how do you use that so you know it's not about all you know all sorts of different gear so i i, I you know i like that simple um approach but i you know, i think i can i i can relate though to, to that sort of very light tackle very uh it can be stuff. a slippery slope can't it going into the kind of tackle tart um kind of it i'm the same all the gear in my shed is second hand and it's it's it does the job but it's um Mm. it's pretty scuffed up and it's been well used <laughs> yeah quite like that i mean I've, I've also um let me see i've also been fishing a bit for sort of tench and stuff like that oh, okay. and yes and so i've i've brought you know i've 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 retrieved my old mitchell 410s and my you know the the the, the carp rods that i made myself and stuff like that and you know, getting those out after so many years is quite uh is, is is quite interesting um yeah nice to mm. nice to to dust them off i mean you, you mm. mentioned about all these shoots is is there one 
probably hard to pick one, but is there one that really stands out? You're like, that was absolutely incredible for, for whatever reason. doesn't necessarily have to be the fishing, but just think this was an in, incredible place or, or people that you met or something along those lines. Yes. I mean, the, it, it's interesting because it's, you know, as an angler, it, it's, it's often the, it, it's often the fish and <laughs> a few, a, a few, a few of those stand out. I mean, one, one would be the very first one, that goonch catfish and, and the, the circumstances of this fish that I, you know, the river was in flood, you know, the monsoon rains were coming and the, 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 I hooked finally this, what I knew was a very big fish, but it's, it's leaving the pool and there's no way I can follow it on land. And I'd sort of done a, you know, I'd done a, a whole sort of what if, you know, what do I, what do I do if it, if it just runs down river? And I decided, well, I, I could maybe jump in and try and get to the other side, and, uh, and, which is what I ended up doing. And, and, um, and, and the guy who filmed that did such a good job of it as well. Um, you know, that, 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 no, that very much stays in my memory. Um, things, um, a couple of other things, actually both in the sea. One was uh, a few years ago um, going, going down in a homemade mini submarine oh, okay. uh, off, off, the, uh, off Honduras uh, on the edge of the Cayman Trench. So uh, looking for six gill sharks and we went down over 2000 feet and uh, that experience of going to the bottom of the ocean and it wasn't in some sort of business class submersible it was in this <laughs> thing that this american expat had sort of put together himself and um and i mean just just an incredible experience i mean just to get the idea of the depth across so we you know we came out of his dock uh we were on the surface we go over the reef and then we close the hatch and then we we you know we flood the the, you know, the ballast tanks so we're, we're we're sinking and you can see the the the, you know, the particles in the water going past us and we're heading down to the bottom and to reach the bottom was 45 minutes you know it's like just sinking or you know sort of good you know just and the depth gauge is you know the needle this old-fashioned <laughs> needle just going round and round and uh, yeah and then we're down there for I mean, I think the first time I was, I was in that, yeah, we were down there for eight or nine hours in this, uh, in, in this space that you can hardly move. That was, um, you know, there's a, there's a slight edge of terror, but, but I mean, but, 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 yeah, but at the same time, it just, just an amazing experience. Uh, and then uh, another thing that stands out was we, the, um, was filming uh, oar fish in the Mediterranean, and and so um, going going out on a going out on a dive boat, and then at night, jumping in the water. And at one time, uh, at one time, I had three oar fish around me, and I, I believe that's the yeah, that's that's never happened before on that's on, the on camera. Sea serpent fish, isn't it? People thought there was sea serpent. That that's right. You know, this is this is the fish that. Um, occasionally, they turn up dead or dying in the shallows. Um, they're, they're they're never really seen other than that, and um, yeah, there's just this very you know this long ribbon-like silvery thing with this strange sort of crest, um, and yeah, I mean you know there I was, and, and and the main one that was there was just quite unconcerned. It's just sort of like, in fact, at one at one point. Um, we've 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 filmed the the, the ore fish and it's like i i need to do a bit of a piece to camera just to sort of say where we are or whatever and i and the, you know the, the, the cameraman is there and i'm here and i'm starting to and then the, you know the, the cameraman just halfway through me talking was just just went like that and this thing had just come and was looking over my shoulder <laughs> so, <laughs> and, um, what are you so doing there was, you know, <laughs> yeah so there was, there was you know it was quite a quite an interaction Amazing. And obviously one of the things kind of associated with River Monsters is all the uh, predicaments and scrapes you've got into. So I think over the course of your career, you've had cerebral malaria, you've been arrested for spying in Southeast Asia, yeah. and you've been in a, a plane crash in the Amazon. So I wondered, what was your most kind of hair raising uh, moment on your travels? Oh, um... I, well, I, you know, the, the, the plane crash would have to be up there. Yeah. Although the, 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 I mean, the thing about that was it, it, it happened so quickly. 
Um, it was caught on film as well, wasn't it? It was. That's right. We were we were filming at the time, and 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 so what was interesting about that is that we were able to play back. I mean, we we had three cameras on board. Uh, two of them were destroyed, but one one kept going, and so we were able to look at that. And the 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 thing that was really interesting was. Um, you know your your perception of events and before we watch that back um we we you know we we were th you know i i was thinking everybody agreed that you know the the, the process that you know the time that elapsed between this bang and the plane starting to shake and us actually you know crashing into the into the canopy you know, we, we thought that was like three or four minutes and um when we played it back just trying to remember now it was you know it was it was it was actually seconds it was something like um yeah. four was it 14 seconds I can't, I can't remember it was but your how the how time really does does stretch, stretch. yeah and 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 again i think um yeah well i, I was well you know, what do you do when that's happening? And I, I remember just sort of thinking about, um, right, I've got to adopt the, I've got to drop, drop the, the crash position. Uh, but then, but I was in the co-pilot seat. So there's all these switches and things in front of me and the, and the co-pilot's uh, yoke is there. So, yeah. it's, you know, if, if I do that, I'm just spreading myself over the instruments that, you know, he's not going to be very pleased about that. So I just literally uh clenched everything <laughs> and, and just waited and as 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 the in my peripheral vision i could just see the, the you know the trees coming up you know and it's like and then there was this uh this sort of ghostly just just the you know the first flick of of uh the tops of the trees on, on the on the bottom of the plane just this little flick and then another flick and then another one and then just phew, everything goes dark you know so because you're just helping um, aren't you what can you do you know it's... exactly exactly um i mean we yeah i mean it was it was very much down to the pilot you know he was uh you know he just he he swore and then and then it was right right you know he was <laughs> doing stuff you know he was you know he was he was basically you know, he's trying to restart I mean you know he was trying to restart the engine uh, he was getting all the flaps out and I mean basically you know what we did in the end we basically stalled in the in the crown of a tree and luckily luckily that was a tree there was a tree next to it that had a had a trunk sort of three quarters of a meter across luckily the one that we stalled in that you know the, the the whole tree just bent and flexed absorbed the the impact and then and then cracked and so um rather than us being crumpled um our you know kinetic energy was absorbed by what what turned out to be a rubber tree actually which is quite funny uh, okay yeah oh your life to that tree <laughs> uh and i was researching all these fish you've investigated and obviously uh trying to pick one to talk about and you've mentioned these gonch these indian catfish that mm. eat uh human remains and You've got bull sharks hundreds of miles up river, but I think the one that I would find most frightening by far is the uh, the kandiru or kandaru. Probably not saying that. Kandaru, right. yes. And yes. I just wondered if you could tell me a little bit about that. Right. <laughs> you probably um, know where I'm going with this. <laughs> yes, I know. It's 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 it's, it's slightly com complicated. This one because that term actually refers to two as two different fish, which are unrelated, which they both call that. But the one uh, the one that that people tend to remember when they hear about it is the one that um yes if you if you are if you are relieving yourself in the river um these are the fish and they're, they're about the size um they're you know two or two or three inches long and and just you know just just very very thin and, and what happens is that they will they will swim up the the urine stream. They will and they will go into the urethra, and because they have these sort of spikes on their um, on their their, their gill plates, um, even if the tail is still out, you know you're you're you know you're not you're not going to be able to pull it out. So um, so uh, surgery is required, and and people imagine this this is you know is this some kind of uh is this some kind of myth well we actually met a guy that it, it had happened to oh, God. and uh yeah and he you know he'd he'd gone to he'd gone to the he'd actually been sent away from from one hospital they thought he was making it up and by the time that by the time somebody actually operated you know this poor guy it had been i can't remember how long it had been you know it had been many hours 
and of course you know in that time you you, you know you you can't you can't urinate so you know your 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 bladder is just sort of is just backing up meanwhile this thing has died it's starting to rot inside you you know and it's just just horrendous um and you sort of you know and and, and again um i suppose the river monsters uh you know what we try and do is is why does the fish do that? You know, has it, it, does it just really hate people? You know, that's, <laughs> yeah, you know, the, 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 yeah, the, you know, because that's the, you know, the immediate thing is you just hear about something like that. And I, I think that's, you know, there is a lesson, isn't there? There's, you know, but I'm just thinking at the moment, you know, the state of the world and all the rest of it, you know, it's very easy to sort of jump to conclusions and like, oh my God, you know, fish are evil. Well, no, hang on a minute, you know, let's try and understand what's going on here. Um, and in the case of someone getting their foot bitten, it's actually, well, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty murky down there. This fish is an ambush predator. Anything pale that goes in front of its face, it thinks it's a small fish, it's gonna bite it. It doesn't know it's a, a foot attached to somebody, you know? So let's let's try and understand what's happened and uh, and therefore help people to avoid this kind of thing in the future. Um, and the, the thing with these kangaroo is, is that they are, what they normally do is they normally parasitize big fish. So if you imagine a, a big catfish it's got this you know this leather like uh, body covering um it's it's you know most fish are you know they, they they are well protected once they get to a decent size but they have vulnerabilities and one of the places they're vulnerable is 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 the gill filaments you know the gill filaments being very delicate that's where they do their their, their gas exchange and the kangaroo has has adapted or what they will do they can they can actually they can detect the current and also the chemical composition which is different and so they can locate the gill opening on a fish and then then they can get in the fish and then they will attach to the, the gill filaments and and they will drink the blood of, of the fish they will sort of you know they will rasp mm. their way through and I, I've seen this with big catfish in the Amazon is if you if you if you catch a fish and that fish is tired and you're holding it in in the margins you know waiting for it to to recover the kangaroo the little fish well you know they'll appear they, they you know they they it's it is quite uncanny they, they know that there is a weak fish there and um you you shoo them away some of them might some of them might find their way in and and you know what's going to happen is once that fish gathers strength they you know they're, they're going to be gone but um they exploit that vulnerability so it's 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 a it, it's a very highly adapted parasite and when it and and what they're detecting from the you know from the, the, the you know the gill outlet is current uh, i think maybe a slightly raised temperature and and also u urea being being a um you know a, uh, a byproduct of, of, of metabolism which is also eliminated there so if if somebody is sitting in the water and decides to have a wee then uh these fish are going to detect that and, and it's you know they, they they're just responding to it to a like a very strong signal of what they're looking for anyway and uh you know if you don't do something you know unless you're wearing a tight swimming costume and you get out of there sharpish that you know they might find their they might find their way uh, inside you which is pretty horrifying not it's not ideal is it you, so you, you know you need to it, it helps to know about them so that uh you know, i mean there there is um you know, some people believe that if you're get, maybe getting to slightly too much detail here, but some people believe that if, you know, if you are a man and you're standing outside the water and you're, and you're weeing into the river, you know, these things actually swim up the, uh, which is complete nonsense. No, you've got it. You've got, you know, you actually, you actually have to be in the water. Be in there. Uh, yes. But uh, no, it, it, no, but you know, a, a very, a very real um, danger in the Amazon. Definitely. Well, look, before we go, I'm just going to do a couple of quick fire questions on some of your uh, favourites. So um, what, what was the first fish you caught? I have a bit of a composite memory. I think it was it was either a roach or a um, okay. a roach or rudin, two, you say, two, sorry. Uh, sorry, a gudgeon. Oh, gudgeon. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, I can't. I have two memories of two different bridges and fishing off the bridges and, uh, you know, I caught a roach off one and a gudgeon off the other, but I'm not sure what order they they came in. They're both often the first uh, fish for me. Mm. Have Have you got a, a favourite fish? Ah, I, get, I bet you, you must get asked this all the time. I I don't know. I mean, I I think um, arapaima has to be a candidate because Ara, they're, they're they're fascinating. I've got a lot of history with arapaima. I was 
I was injured by an aeroplane. I was uh, that was another uh, you know another 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 injury. I was I was headbutted by an, uh, by a sort of 70, 70 pound fish in in the chest, which was um, but that serious, hurt. serious blow. Actually, I've, somebody just sent me. Um, it, yeah, it did. I mean, it was <laughs> it was uh, it, it sent me flying. Just yesterday, uh, somebody sent me a clip from Brazil of some some fishermen they had a, a, a an arapaima sort of 70 80 pounds that they caught and it's it's on the bank and somebody is actually with a knife is actually making a hole in its in its uh, the root of its tail so that they can sort of drag it and this guy um clambers over the top of this fish and in that moment it flexes sideways and, and with its head it hits him in the, in the in the face and this guy is lying on the ground you know i mean the, the, they are uh, uh bone, you know, I guess, they, head that's that's right and 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 they and, and if they flex if you're in a position where they can flex sideways and hit you it can be it can be really nasty and i've heard a number of you know a number of stories uh Including one cameraman who 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 was basically rammed and, and smashed by one of these things, you know. So um, and, and the thing, you know, they, they are just um, they they can be very stupid. They can be they can be very easy to catch, and they can be incredibly incredibly intelligent. And and I think you know because it's a fish that I've I've spent a lot of time with. I think it it. it it's a fish that has very much told me about, um, and I, I guess I guess you probably see this if you're hanging out with fish underwater. You know, they they are, and I think anglers generally start to get this realization that fish are individuals. You know, they're they're not all the same. They're not all just gen, you know generic barbel, generic chub, or whatever. You know, fish have sort of personalities, some, and they're capable of learning, and they're capable of incredible learning. Um, definitely, definitely would agree with that um yeah yeah i would i would say so because they have parental care as well don't they arapaima i think yeah that's right yeah that that is yes they have a they have a little you know the, the, a little shoal of young and the, the adults protect them and that's why um that's that's the situation where if you if you jump in the water near their nest or near their young that's when they're going to go for you again it's not it's not because they've got anything against people it's just any anything comes near their young and they'll go for you um and it, and actually interestingly sorry this is a bit of a tangent you see the same thing you see the same thing with some snakeheads now for an arapaima which is you know possibly two meters long uh going you know ramming a, a, a ramming a full-grown human that, that's that's one thing but for a uh for for a snakehead that's maybe you know just sort of 18 inches two feet something like that sorry i'm mixing my metric and all the rest of it but you know <laughs> angler. um you know but that you know a, a yeah a snakehead will will you know they'll they'll go for people if they if they if they come near their young so a lot of it a lot of these uh so-called attacks that you hear about is actually protecting the young yeah which is you know it's mm. interesting they're gonna mm. do sticklebacks yeah. not quite as impressive but sticklebacks mm. do the same you know if you were mm. i used to keep them in a tank to film and if you put the net in to move something they'd start dipping at the the net so mm. it's exactly the same uh, same behavior have you got a a favorite venue or, or a favorite place that you fish it like that was you know that was really special um can I just come back on the last one? Actually, yeah, sorry. Cool. While, while, you, while you were talking about <laughs> sorry, while, while you were talking about sticklebacks, I remembered something else. I remembered being in uh, in, in in the US uh, in uh, upstate New York, and um, there was a smallmouth bass that that was sort of uh, that had, that had marked out. You know, it, it it clearly had this this territory that was this space in the middle of these rocks. And it's and it's right next to the bank, and it's not phased by people on the bank or anything. And I'm thinking, oh, this is fascinating. I put on a, I put on a mask and a, and a snorkel. I thought I'll have a I'll have a, a closer look at this. And I just I just literally I, I just swung my my feet in the side of, of the river there, and and I just put my face in to look at this uh, this smallmouth bass, which was, you know, that kind that kind of size, you know, eight or nine inches. This thing came and smacked me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> you know this the, 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 you know again, just territorial and and you know um savage uh, by a bass yeah yeah <laughs> you know amazing um venue <laughs> venue venue where were favorite venue oh very hard to 
Because I guess for anglers, sometimes like there are venues that are absolutely beautiful, but maybe the fishing isn't very good, mm. and vice versa. There are places where the fishing's brilliant, but it's not much to to look right. at. Right. Well, uh, I mean, here's one place that, st that stays in my mind. I mean, wh when I was traveling, uh, you know, when I was off solo traveling, um, a lot of the places I went to were jungles. You know, I've done so many jungles and jungles can be they can be a bit oppressive. They can be a little bit sort of monotonous. Um, and when I started doing River Monsters, we made a few programs going into very different um, sort of mountainous environments. And I, and I, I, I like mountains. So you, you, okay, people would imagine maybe you don't get fish in mountains, but actually you, you do sometimes. And um, and one place that, that that really blew me away was Mongolia. So fishing for, for Taiman in, in Mongolia, um, it was, you know, there were, I think it was a very significant window. I think you know, a lot of the year it's completely deep frozen, but we were there when there was grass, um, you know, this, you see these amazing rolling fields of, of grass and then mountains, you know, mountains rising directly from, from the riverbank. And I was drifting down in a raft and I'm supposed to be looking at the side of the river, looking for lies and casting to those lies. And I, and I, and I remember just thinking, I, you know, I, I, I want to put the rod down. I just, I just want to watch this landscape rolling past, you know, I'm missing the landscape. If I'm, if I'm just looking at the, looking at the water. But I guess that's um, true wilderness, isn't it? You are in the, the arse end of nowhere, aren't you? It's pretty remote. But also like it was, you know, the, almost like it has been, you know, landscaped by, you know, almost just landscape designed, just, just this, just so, uh, so dramatic and just unrolling. And again, I think that's the thing. If you're, if you're going down the, if you're going down the river like that, it's a bit like watching a fire or watching fish in an aquarium. It, you know, the picture is constantly changing. And, and because of that, you can just look at it forever. And the same thing with this landscape. It's, I'm not looking at the same thing. It's just, it's, just, it's, just, it's just moving. It's unrolling in front of my eyes. And, and I, I just wanted to, um, yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, get, bring the line in. Just look at, just look at where, where I am for, for, for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely appreciate that. I've I've not quite on the same scale, but I've been to places like Shetland when I've been filming wildlife and when I've had a day off, I'll go sea trout fishing on one of the sea locks or something like that. And it's, you know, you've got the rolling hills, you've got this beautiful sea lock and an otter, not good for the fishing, but good to watch, you know, beautiful mm. otter mm. might go by and it is, uh, it's nice to, to breathe that all in. Um, you mentioned you've taken up fly fishing. Is, is that a favourite method or have you got a favourite method? Um, I mean, I quite, I, I, I don't, I, I quite like, you know, that the, the, there is the satisfaction of the technique. I mean, I'm still, you know, I'm still pretty much a beginner on that. I mean, I have to say that, uh, just going back to what I was saying earlier about gear. I mean, my my, I suppose, the, the you know, the technique I use most of the time is just, uh, you know, it, it's just a, a big hook on the end, uh, a, a leader of sort of, you know, 18 inches or so, and then just a, a, a rolling, you know, um, a rolling um, sliding lead, just just very simple. And I think, you know, a lot of what I do, um, it's fishing big rivers, um, fishing, uh, fishing on the bottom, it's fishing uh, like a lump of dead fish normally on the bottom. And I suppose, yeah it, it's 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 about reading the current and being able to present a bait in in what looks like an unfishable river uh but being able to present a bait in a way that you can you can get it to settle somewhere um where the current is doing something interesting it's a bit of an eddy uh maybe which might even be a vertical eddy um and that will be where that, and that's where the fish are you know that's so the thing that i've, I've done really over the years is is i suppose yeah it, it's presenting bait on the bottom in, in in fairly strong currents with you know without using a ton of lead you know that's the secret you know can can you can you explore can you explore that river um you know by shifting where where you're casting from and where you're casting to can you can you play around uh in such a way that you find a place where oh you know it's I can get it to sit there and then if, if it's sitting there it's like oh, that's the kind of place fish are going to be expecting something whether i so the, you know there's, there's there's a satisfaction in that um relatively simple mm. then 
isn't it? Not but then, but then we, it, but it is yes, simple. yeah, yeah it, it, very, relatively simple. And 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 again, it's you know that ten, you know once you've actually once the bait is in position, uh, it, you know it's fairly static. It's like I don't, you, you know you can you can you can you can you can make it a bit more interesting. You know sometimes you can you can move it around. You know you retrieve a bit of line and then blah, 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 it'll settle somewhere else. Uh, you know, but it's. Um, no, I, I think coming back to you know for for, for excitement, I think um, you know I, I I like fishing surface lures, and that and that could you know that could be on fly that could be on fly gear, so maybe you know a popper on the surface, or with you know I, I like single handed bait caster, you know that that kind of thing, you know, yeah. and, it, and it's just uh, you I've, know I've done it once with the uh, plastic frogs. I had yeah, a, they're great. Oh, yes. And uh, I thought it was a wind up. Someone said, You'll catch a pie. And I'm like, There's no way they're going to take, bunged it out and brought it in. It just, it's like Jaws. It's this pipe yes. erupted out the yes. lily pad. It was just, oh, my heart was, it wasn't a very big pipe, but the method was uh, adrenaline yes. juicing. Absolutely. And I, I think sometimes it's almost, you know, if you've got a weak heart, you know, that's, that's not <laughs> something to do because, um, you know, I've done, I've done quite a bit of that kind of fishing for, for people bass in Sarica and it's almost like you know you look at it you think this isn't really a feeding response this is like this is like aggression it's you know you've just come into its space but that space is a lot bigger than you think I mean you know you, you some some of the water where it's a bit clearer um you know you're fishing maybe sort of eight foot of water and you're popping something across the surface and you see something come you know this sort of streak come up diagonally from the bottom you know it's seen it from you know it's it's seen it from from you know a few meters away and it's and it's just it's just coming to kill it you know and it's just and it's just yeah it, it comes out of nowhere see how people would would get addicted to it i'll mm. i'll end on this last one Derry. have you got a angling hero uh I suppose when I, you know, when I when I started off, Richard Walker was very much, um, you know, was very much the person. You know, it's not just a case of chuck your line out there. It's it's think about it. You you can catch, um, you can catch big fish by design. And and then there was a whole, you know, a load of other people around that time, sort of following on from him. Um, some of the people I've, some, you know, some of the sort of local fishermen that I've that I've met over the years um, have taught me a lot. Um, one person who influenced me a lot was was actually a guy when I was a kid who fished on our local river, and he was the um, you don't really get them these days. He was the, the the local cobbler, the local shoe repairer, and he would he would be this lone figure I would occasionally see over over the fields, and he you know he caught. He caught fish out of out of that river that nobody else sort of came came close to. Just you know his uh, yes, and and, uh, and I think again um, that sort of you know in, in inspired me. You know that there there are there are big fish which are there for the for the taking if your approach is right. Just people who spend all their time on it and get to learn the river and know the river. Um, mm. it's amazing if you spend i mean you'll probably know this because you do spend a lot of time in one place and you might revisit it years later it's amazing how much they change isn't it you know um yes. even just in the uk as well well actually that's you know funnily enough that's something i that i miss because i'm doing you know doing, doing a lot of the tv programs very often i go somewhere i'm not there for very long and that's it and and, and i'll probably never go back which can be good because it concentrates the mind. You know, this is your one opportunity, so you, so do it right. Um, if you have any ideas, anything you want to experiment, you know, do it now. You won't be able to do it in the future. But I do miss the thing that I that I did when I was a kid, which was going to the same stretch of river, you know, different times of the year, different seasons, and and seeing it change. And I suppose I'm you know I'm starting to reconnect a little bit with that uh, at the moment. One of the upsides of uh, lockdown to a degree as well, we're being forced to mm. look at our local patches. And, and I mean, there's a canal not too far away from where I live and I hadn't paid it much attention, but I, I was snorkeling in it this summer because I didn't have much else to, to crack on with. And I've been walking my dog along it and I'm starting to realise where all the rud are and the pike. So it's nice to, to see all that. Um, yeah. It's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, Jeremy. It's always always nice to to waffle about fish to a fellow, fellow fish botherer. Um, I should say as well to to people that myself and Jeremy are working on 
uh, Britain's Hidden Fishers, which will be, by the time this podcast comes out, will still be campaigning. So there'll be a link in the description for that to uh, check it out. But hopefully that will get going and we'll be able to work on a pretty special film on British fish. Yes, it'll be, it'll be great if that, you know, if, if that you know, comes to, to light because it's, there, there is this incredible, you know, all this stuff is right under our noses and, and uh, anglers know... You know, ang anglers have this window into it, but I think a lot of people who, who like their natural history, um, yeah, you know, fish, fish are, are very un under, uh, don't get enough attention. And this, this, this seeks to uh, put that right. That's the hope. That's the dream of it all. Look, buddy, thanks for everything. Take care and I'll see you soon. Thank you very much. I, I've enjoyed it.